Chapter 17 Doors Close, Doors Open One last story about material, about just how long it can take for stuff, even stuff I love, to see the light of day, or in this case, HBO. Sometime in the late 80s, I began to see things in my files like, Hey, let's just kill everybody. That was only one brief thought, but I remember thinking, here's an opportunity to create some art. Obviously, I don't think it would be a good idea to kill everybody, but at the same time, it was a good idea to let loose in the world. If I could come up with enough semi, quasi, pseudo reasons and methods for getting rid of everybody in the world, except for a nice workable 200,000, including me, I've got a great piece. The boilerplate definition of satire is taking on the mentality of your enemy. At this point, it was still Reagan and his gang, and taking it to extremes in an ingenious way. I guess that's what this was, instinctively anyway. Reagan's basic worldview was that to save the American way of life, everybody had to be ready to die in a nuclear holocaust. Except, of course, a nice workable 200,000 Republicans, including him. So, being 1,000% for that kind of ultra-violence, really enthusing about it, relishing it, was fun. It appealed to the extreme in me. Some part of comedy is always about excess. Over time, the idea grew in my files. Other similar ideas attached themselves to the core one. I began testing them out in shows on the road. As I played out a piece on stage, a character began to emerge who wasn't just an advocate of death on a massive scale, but a real lover of it. Finding this out was wonderful. I used a very calm voice and manner, a really friendly, really open and honest clinical sociopath. I could be the clinical sociopath. Play as glee with all the carnage, enjoy it, not just suggest it, and by getting them to go along with my glee and laugh at it, driving home that this was something deep down in our psyche. That was confirmed by hearing this certain laughter of complicity from the audience, a knowing, accepting laughter. Things have a way of telling me when they want to be done, and this piece wasn't bursting out of me yet. It would need a lot of writing and polishing. Stage time to get all the parts working together plus a major memorizing job, which doesn't get any easier when you'll never see 60 again. I already had enough stuff for the next HBO show in 99, including a great closer, There Is No God. So I kept honing this piece, and it evolved into a complex catastrophe, leaving millions dead in every possible kind of disaster unfolding across the continent, disrupting the laws of nature, full of the kind of grisly poetry, a real tour de force along the lines of The planet is fine, but darker and madder. I had big hopes for the next HBO. It would be my twelfth, and twelve is a magical kind of number, and it had the makings of an explosive show with a big fat target in the White House, Governor Bush and his Christian fucks. I had a sledgehammer values piece, why we don't need Ten Commandments, and I had this major new tour de force. Taping was set for the Beacon Theater on November 17th. I named the entire show for the new piece. I had a hunch it was going to be the first HBO in a decade to equal, maybe even surpass Jammin. I held on to that hunch right up till 8.46 a.m., September 11th, 2001, when the first plane hit because the show was called. I really like it when a lot of people die. I'm a realist. We changed the name of the show to Complaints and Grievances. If there were such a thing as generic George Carlin, that title would be stenciled on the box. At least I didn't have to abandon the piece. It made it into the 2005 HBO Life is Worth Losing. That would be about 17 years after it had first come down the birth canal. But I wasn't taking any chances. 
I called it coast-to-coast -coast emergency. It was the finale and the best thing in the show. So now I have it polished perfect and put on tape, and I'll keep it forever. The piece had evolved into a narrative of a nationwide cataclysm with small beginnings in L.A., a downtown water main breaks and floods an electrical substation. At the same time, a month-long global warming heat wave hits. Because everything in L.A. runs on electrical power, including air conditioning and hospitals, social chaos soon spreads through the city, bringing with it cholera and smallpox and fires that firefighters can't fight with no water until the entire city is ablaze. Everybody panics and tries to leave the city at the same time, and they trample each other to death in the streets by the thousands, and wild dogs eat their corpses, and the wild dogs chase the rest of the people down the highway, and one by one the dogs pick off the old fucks and the slow people because they're in the fast lane where they don't belong. The fire spreads, blowing up meth labs and incinerating Bambi and confusing George Bush until the entire North American continent is on fire. A thermal updraft causes an incendiary cyclonic macro system that forms a hemispheric megastorm that breaks down the molecular structure of the atmosphere and actually changes the laws of nature. Then, suddenly, the entire fabric of space-time splits in two. A huge crack in the universe opens, and all the dead people from the past begin falling through. Babe Ruth, Groucho Marx, Davy Crockett, Tiny Tim, Porky Pig, Hitler, Janis Joplin, Alan Ludden, my Uncle Dave, your Uncle Dave, everybody's Uncle Dave, an endless stream of dead Uncle Daves. And all the Uncle Daves gather round a heavenly kitchen table, and they light up cigarettes, and they begin to talk about how they never got a break. Their parents didn't love them, and their children were ungrateful, and how the Jews own everything, and the blacks get special treatment, and their hatred and bitterness forms a big pool of liquid hate, and the pool of liquid hate begins to spin, round and round, faster and faster. The faster it spins, the bigger it gets, until the whirling pool of hate is bigger than the universe, and suddenly it explodes into trillions of tiny stars, and every star has a trillion planets, and every planet has a trillion Uncle Daves. And all the Uncle Daves have good jobs, perfect eyesight, and shoes that fit. They have great sex lives and free health care. They understand the Internet. Their kids think they're cool. And every week, without fail, Uncle Dave wins the lottery. Forever and ever, until the end of time, every single Uncle Dave has a winning ticket. And Uncle Dave is finally happy. On April 5th, 1997, Brenda was diagnosed with cancer of the liver. They said the cancer had metastasized from her breast cancer and attacked her liver, always vulnerable because of the hepatitis C. A liver transplant was not an option because of her previous cancer. Some part of me probably knew it was the end. The part of me that always looks for the brighter side got the better of it. She'd survived so often, with all the progress in chemo and radiation, new drugs, protocols, treatments. Why not again? I decided to keep working. I'd always been disturbed that my actions in the 70s concerning my money and other behaviors had put me in the position where I had to be away from Brenda so much. I have a thoughtful nature. As a child, I did. And I'd always tried to do things for her that would be described as thoughtful acts, unprompted, unbidden. First, to make her more comfortable in every way in her physical feelings and her emotional world. And secondly, to let her know I was trying to compensate consciously, trying to atone, my mother's word, very Catholic, of course, for these absences. And 97 was an unusually busy season, with the normal work schedule plus Aspen in February, and the book tour for my first book, Brain Droppings, which was to begin in May. I'd said to Brenda, I'm working on our retirement. We're close to being even. I'm trying to get ahead of the game. Set some things in place that will make us less likely to be eaten by dogs later in life. I saw that as part of the atonement. But the initial diagnosis had been incorrect. 
the cancer hadn't metastasized from her previous one. It was new, separate, and aggressive. In fact, the oncologist told us afterwards, of course, when it was too late to act upon, that under the microscope it was the most aggressive cancer he'd ever seen. Brenda deteriorated rapidly, and on the morning of May 11th, Mother's Day, she crashed. She was already unconscious when Kelly got her to St. John's. At midday, all her systems shut down, and her heart stopped. I was in New York. I grabbed the first plane I could find. The doctors restarted Brenda's heart, and Kelly had them put her on life support till I could get back. I hadn't seen her for a week or more. Jaundice had made her skin yellow. All her hair was gone from the chemo. She was unconscious and unresponsive, but her eyes were open. I have no idea if she was aware of anyone, but I saw her eyes tearing up a little. I took a tissue and gently wiped away her tears. My own health problems seemed to be on hold. I had a third, pretty serious heart attack in 91 while driving to Vegas, and a follow-up one, less serious, in 94. In 97, the angina came back. I didn't fool around. I checked into the hospital and they took a look. They did an angioplasty with a stent, a mesh cylinder, like a Chinese finger puzzle that remains in the artery to keep it open. One strange thing about my heart problems is that I've always gotten in on, if not the leading edge of technology, things that were still in the experimental stage. When I got my stent, the procedure hadn't yet been approved by the FDA. It was only in use in six hospitals. I was lucky again, as with the streptokinase after my first heart attack, that they were experimenting with it in that particular hospital. At the time, the only other person I knew about who'd had a stent was Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa had a stent. I had a stent. My mother would have been proud. People ask me in interviews sometimes, didn't the heart attacks change your life? Didn't they change you? And I say, no, not really. Obviously, I had to start exercising because I'd been sedentary my whole life. I had to start eating correctly because I'd been an American slob eater my whole life. Those were the only two changes. I've never lived with a sword of Damocles. I guess I know another can strike at any moment so I don't know how much of it is this wonderful thing we've discovered, denial. I don't think so. Denial has a different flavor. This is just being sensible about yourself and not being a fucking martyr and a victim. One reason that I don't worry too much about these things is that I'm happy in love. I met Sally Wade about six months after Brenda's death. She was a comedy writer based in Hollywood who'd wanted to meet me but was a bit shy about it. So her dog Spot made the first move for her. We fell for each other. I've always been lonely for people like me, and she was a kindred spirit. Still, with Brenda's death so recent, I wasn't ready yet. Sally waited for me, and when we got together, I knew she would be the love of my life. And she is. A big part of my job is exploding clichés but it seems impossible to talk about what Sally and I have without them. I've always used a couple, so here's a couple more. It was love at first sight. We're crazy about each other. We have a great love together. And there's more where those came from. The weird thing is they're all true. At my age, I'm allowed a little inconsistency. Throughout the 90s and whatever we call this decade, the zeros, works for the Bush years, I've had a constant sense of growth and growing strength. I've always had the path ahead of me as my artistic life unfolded, sometimes with side roads and cul-de-sacs, true, but in spite of them a sense of growing internally, intellectually, emotionally, of constantly finding a better way to craft my work, and thanks to Jerry there'll always be a room full of people somewhere willing to sit quietly in the dark. Not too quietly, obviously, but at least sit in an orderly fashion and appreciate me and listen to my stuff and pay. That has a life-giving aspect. That is what I live for. 
People always ask questions like, how can you go on? Aren't you anxious to retire? Aren't you tired of the road? But I realized something very simple a long time ago. I can't do what I love to do without these people. I have to go where they live. They're not going to come to my house, even if I pay them. You may have 30, 40 years under your belt. You may feel really good about your shit. You may know exactly what you're going to do and that they're predisposed to like you. But the instant I get out there, it all starts over again, right from the beginning. Win them over and get them where I want them. That's living. That's the thing that feeds me. That's my nourishment. Long ago, I described my job as being a fool. And that's still what I do. Once this kind of comedy was called the people's art, a vulgar art. Maybe all comedy is. I prefer live stand-up comedy to any other form. Since my changes in the early 70s, I've only used television as an advertisement for myself. I've been blessed and cursed by events and circumstances that have made me, I think, one of the principal stand-ups of this era. The stand-up who has stayed longest with the stand-up form as his prime thing and made it what he does. Therefore, I've had a chance to take some forward steps with it, at least for myself. I think I can say I'm one of the few people who, in the absence of a movie career or a television career, have taken this form to higher levels. That feels good. That feels special. If I was still doing an act exactly as I did it 20 years ago, I'd be ready for a large, blunt weapon. Instead, I have a feeling of progress and of achievement. I've contributed a little to the vulgar art. <laughs>